Um, you didn't miss too much. Just I was just explaining um, my background, who I was, that I've got um, kids that board with me that come to Melanda and that I'm a doctor with a special interest in child health and nutrition. Um, so, and we're just saying, you know, what's what's sort of changed? Because we, we've all sort of grown up with having probably quite a bit of sugar. You know, we've had the nice desserts and the cakes and, you know, we've turned out okay. And um, But we're just saying that a lot more uh, processed foods are in our diet now and even savoury foods have sugar in them. Um, we have a lot more um, sugary foods that are eaten more often. And we're also drinking really high sugar um, drinks, and that seems to be more normalised than ever. I know when I was a kid, soft drink was sort of an occasional treat, uh, and we mostly drank water. And even my, um, you know, parent, uh, friends with less strict parents sort of maybe had cordial, but I don't sort of remember the shopping trolleys full of cartons of soft drink cans or at every sort of event. Um, and the other thing is that as a society, we're becoming less and less active. You know, kids are on their phones and devices instead of running around climbing the trees. So they're burning less and less of this energy than before. So um, our sugar intake should actually be going down, but it's going up. So why do we even worry about sugar? What are some of the things that sugar can do? And don't get scared by this um, very wordy slide. I'm not going to get too technical tonight. I'll just give you a bit of an overview. Um, but what these are some of the things that they found in studies that sugar can do. So the first one is on how our brain works. So we know it can affect memory, can affect learning and academic performance, attention and focus. And obviously all those things are really important for school. Now, we know about energy levels. People know about that, you know, boost they get from their sugary drink or the chocolate bar. Um, but then your body pumps out a heap of insulin. So you get a big uh, sugar low and you get what they call a sugar crash. So um, then you get more tired, you're less productive um, and so on. Now, it also affects our emotional well-being. So you get sugar cravings, mood swings, you become irritable, have poor emotional control. And there's an increased risk of mental health disorders. Physical health is the one maybe people are a bit more familiar with. We know there's a higher risk of obesity and that, that can be linked to poor academic performance. And there's a higher chance of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, um, dental issues, everyone knows about that one, um, and other health complications. And then there's those social issues, you know, that peer pressure to consume those sugary foods and drinks and the stigmatisation you can get with weight and other health issues. So given that we use our brain for school and learning, let's have uh, a closer look at the impacts of sugar on the brain. So um, as we mentioned, it could cause memory impairment, um, a lack of focus, particularly after that initial high in those sugar crashes. Uh, they have, it causes slow cognitive function, which is another way of saying your, your thinking and the way your brain works slows down, problems with attention. Uh, a bit concerning too that they've now found it also causes long-term damage, so um, it accelerates ageing of the brain and increases your risk of dementia. So um, this one here, it's science-based, but I'm guessing that quite a few parents and teachers have worked this one out already, that sugar can actually be an addiction, so uh, an actual true addiction. So we know that sugar can cause a strong release of dopamine, so that's a chemical in the brain that's connected to addiction. So it's the same chemical that gets released with drugs, alcohol, gambling, phones, and that's another talk for another time. <laughs> Uh, it could all be addictive. So we know that sugar can be a true addiction. And we know it impacts the mesolimbic area of the brain and it affects your emotional regulation and increases your risk of mental health disorders like depression, anxiety, mood swings and irritability. And of concern, these effects can, um, some of these can happen after a single dose of sugar and can apply to everyone, not just people with ADHD. So um, in terms of physical health, um, we know that sugar is probably the main contributor to childhood obesity. A lot of people sort of think, of, you know, fatty foods and, oh, you know, they're, they're doing the right thing, giving their kid low fat foods. But um, the main contributor is actually sugar and a lot of those foods are high in sugar. We know that we're facing a growing tide of type 2 diabetes in kids. Now, for the non-doctor people, that's actually really concerning because type 2 diabetes is the one you see in older people from lifestyle, you know, um, or diet and things like that. And we're starting to see more and more kids with that. Um, we know that we're the first generation where the parents' life expectancy is going to be greater than their kids. And mostly that's down to poor diet. 
So um, over the years, you know, we're, our life expectancy is getting greater and greater, better technology, better medicines, better knowledge. Um, but now we're going to go backwards because, I don't know, McDonald's and all that stuff and sugar. We know that um, school, you know, the stuff that kids have at school can be a major contributor to their daily sugar intake. And we, um, as I mentioned, obesity can impact on academic performance and mental health. So why should schools care about sugar? You might say, well, you know, that's not the three R's. It's not our, you know, not um, school talk. Um, but, you know, schools talk about nutrition in HPE. They talk about cyberbullying. They have sex education and so on. So obviously there's, you know, it's more than just the three R's. We also know that sugar consumption can have negative consequences on, as we said, on the brain function, their attention, their academic performance and their mental health, and that, they, and that poor health can affect their attendance and achievement. And I've actually had teachers tell me that they can really see a difference in the classroom when kids come in after a lunch break, you know, when they know they've had sugary foods. Um, so the teachers know it's going on. Um, we also know that schools play a vital role in shaping the dietary habits and overall health of children and, and adolescents. Um, so the school actually has a role as, as a role model, not just for kids, but also for parents and communities. And it can be a bit confusing for kids if we're teaching them in HPE, for example, you know, all this nutrition stuff, eat this, eat that, um, and then tell them it's okay to buy, um, buy stuff at school, you know, the things that we've just told them not to eat. Um, so, so we know that um, the other thing is that students are actually spending a big chunk of their time, you know, their day in school. So obviously that's, um, you know, relevant um, to be. Apologies. Um, and we also know that um, sugar reducing sugar consumption in schools helps address health inequities because um, not always, but often it's the lower income kids who are relying on school meals as their primary source of nutrition, or you know the parent who might be struggling or having to work long hours, more likely to need to use the tuck shop or those um, packaged foods. So um, let's look at sugar and hyperactivity, which I know everyone's interested in. So um, if you look at those effects we talked about, like irritability, fatigue, poor emotion re regulation, um, it makes sense that sugar is going to contribute to your behavioural problems in the class. And if you then have a student with ADHD or ADD, um, sugar is going to have an even bigger impact on them. So sugar in itself um, doesn't cause hyperactivity, but if you've already got an issue with that, it certainly can make things worse. Um, so one kid I know who'd been trying really hard to work on their disruptive behaviour in class and, and was, um, you know, really turning that around had come to the realisation that sneaking a sugary snack from the tuck shop or their friends directly impacted their behaviour behavior and ability to focus sort of in the class or two after that. Now, you might say, well, you know, so it's the ADD kids, there's a couple of them, that's not my problem. Well, um, we think that uh, there's probably around 11% of kids in school have ADHD, according to some reports. I would suggest that it may actually be higher, and we know it's increasing as time goes by. And if you think of sort of this description of an ADHD kid, you know, the disorganised, forgetful student, um, they lack focus, distracted, don't seem to listen or absorb instructions, seem overly emotional, more sensitive to re rejection, more prone to poor decisions, trouble finishing things, losing things, everything's messy, more likely to be impulsive, calling out answers, being disruptive. And of course, all those features are exacerbated by sugar. Now, um, I I'm pretty sure I can hear some of you thinking, well, you've just described all my grade nine boys. Uh, yeah, sure. Puberty does bring out all of these things as well. So you put together puberty, sugar and ADHD and you're really setting, setting a kid up to fail. So what makes um, sugar particularly problematic for the kids with ADHD? So um, firstly, we know that ADHD brains are more prone to addictions. So whether that's phones, drugs, um, whatever, and that includes sugar. So as we heard, sugar can be incredibly addictive um, for anyone, but it's even more powerful addiction for a kid with ADHD. We also know that kids with ADHD can struggle with self-control and self-regulation. So being able to say no to that sugar is even more of a struggle for them. And we know that low sugar is actually uh, part of the recommended management for ADHD. 
So if we want our kids with ADHD to succeed in the school environment, we really need to be doing everything we can um, to help them not by not having sugar even as an option in the school setting and not putting it in their lunch boxes. Okay, so how much sugar is okay? Um, so the recommended limits are 25 grams or five teaspoons of sugar a day for an adult and two to four teaspoons for school kids, according to World Health Organization. Now you might be going, oh, well, I'm fine then. Uh, my kid doesn't sit there eating four spoons of sugar, um, but it's not about that. It's all the sugars in your foods and there's a lot of hidden sugar in, in foods. And scarily, uh, Australians average 70 grams of sugar a day, and that's an average, uh, which is more than three times the recommended amount. Now, a lot of that's from sugary drinks and what they call discretionary food, uh, the things you don't need, like chocolate bars. Some, some of you might argue you do need a chocolate bar, but it's okay. Um, but there's also a lot hidden in foods that you'd never guess. So where is some of this sugar hiding? So, so um, if you look at some of these pictures, some of these are really obvious. I'm pretty sure everyone knows that the bottle of Coke's got loads of sugar, yeah? Um, but, you know, did you know that part, a lot of pasta sauces, salad dressings, you know, that healthy fruit yogurt um, have a lot of sugar in them? Uh, a lot of breads are high in sugar. White flour pretty much turns straight into sugar in your body. Um, and we had a friend staying with us recently who went into the shop and went to the health food section and bought a healthy cereal uh, and looked fantastic. And we looked at the label and there was three types of sugar in it and three spoons of sugar in every bowl of cereal. Um, so if you read the ingredients list on your food, you'll see there um, are lots of different names for different types of sugar too, and there's a bit of a list there of, of other names for sugars. And even the so-called healthy alternatives like honey or dates um, are still high in sugar. And as we've heard, um, a lot of the excess sugar we have is from our drinks and not only the ones you might think of. So um, as you can see here, even the no sugar fruit juices have lots of natural sugar. Uh, energy drinks, flavoured milks, iced teas, and of course, soft drinks all contribute huge, huge amounts of sugar. And in fact, a lot of these, just one bottle, you know, provides more than what you're supposed to have in an entire day. And did you know that if you drink uh, one 600 ml bottle of soft drink a day for a year, you'll have had 23 kilos of sugar? What's that? Well, you might get excited, but I think that's good. <laughs> all right. So um, you might. Um, you might be thinking, well, you know, I give my kids, you know, pretty healthy food. I'm okay. They don't have much sugar. I'm all good. Well, let's have a look at what what it might look like, um, you know, a good menu for a day for a kid. Now, I think a lot of people would look at this um, and think, well, this is pretty great. Um, you know, this parent's doing a fantastic job. They've made a nice sandwich with salad and a homemade blueberry muffin. They're having some fruit, a healthy muesli bar. So they're all good, right? Um, and they've even managed to persuade their kid to have wheat bix with sugar, which is pretty amazing, uh, with that, without sugar, I mean. Yeah, gross. Um, so how much sugar do you think would be in this meal? Does anyone want to have a guess? 45 grams, yeah, good guess. Um, so it's 13 teaspoons, which is actually very close to 45 grams. Well done. Gold star. <laughs> Um, so it's 13 teaspoons of sugar, or three times the recommended amount before they've even got home from school. And this is something that looks pretty good. So, you know, I feel sorry for parents who are trying their best, thinking they're doing the right thing, but not realising how much hidden sugar is creeping into our foods. And did you know that we're all becoming so used to sweetness um, in our foods that there are even now breeding um, vegetables and fruits to have more sugar in them, things like carrots and oranges. So I don't know if anyone's noticed that carrots are sweeter than what they were when they were kids. So um, let's say now that this kid has um, snuck their key card into their bag and they've come to school and gone to the tuck shop and get a Zupa Dupa, a brownie and a bottle of juice to go with their nice sandwich. Um, uh, and then now the total is 127 grams of sugar or 25 teaspoons or six times the recommended amount and they haven't even left the school grounds yet. 
Now, um, I need to say I have had a look at the tuck, tuck shop menu and there are some beautiful and amazing healthy lunch options there, like some really impressive options. I think um, maybe when it comes to the little cheap snacks, you know, the kinds of things you can buy with the $2 they've raided from the car ashtray, as one mum uh, said to me, um, then it can be a lot harder to find those sugar-free treats that the kids want to eat. So I looked at some alternatives to um, to what I hear are the kids' favourites. So the first one is um, the Zupa Dupa Ice Blocks. And you can get zero sugar versions at Woolies, which surprisingly cost the same as the normal ones. And then we did a trial of the brownies that the kids say are very popular at the tuck shop. And I made a version with xylitol. Now, xylitol sounds awful like some chemical, but it's not. It's actually a birch bark-based natural sweetener that tastes just like sugar. Um, and I cut them to the same size as the tuck shop brownies and we calculated that uh, made with xylitol, each slice would cost cost 23 cents more. Unfortunately, it is more expensive. I'm not sure how that, um, you know, what the treasurer uh, thinks of that with the tuck shop or whether that works, but it would be it would be 27 grams less sugar per slice and my taste testers loved it. It was good. Yeah, boys? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and there are lots of other imaginative ideas that I'm sure many parents and other tuck shop conveners have. Now, um, I'm sure I can hear people saying, oh, but it's just a few treats. What's the harm? Don't be such a grouch. You know, you're such a meanie. Okay, there may be so. But, you know, for some kids, and generally the more disadvantaged kids, these things can make up a large proportion of their diet. And we know that students can find control difficult and eat, will eat these things to excess. Um, and hopefully by now you can see that we're already giving our kids way too much sugar, so extra at school is not going to help. And every little bit of sugar at school can have a negative impact on their learning, and that's what the kids are at school for, right? And we can help establish positive eating behaviours for life after school as well. It sounds like so much trying to get in. So, um, there you go. okay, now it's letting me let him in. Okay. All right. So, um, welcome, Matt. Uh, we'll get the recording to you later. Sorry, you missed out. <laughs> okay. So, another argument I've heard is that we should be letting kids um, learn to make these good choices themselves and we just give them the education and then they make the choices, they're young adults, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, look, we've already heard about the challenges that some kids are facing and they already have to make so many good choices at school every day. So why, why would we make this harder? In particular, if you look at this graph, you can see that the part of a kid's brain that makes good decisions, the um, problem solving, the inhibitory control, the you know, self-control, or all those things that we call executive functions, don't actually um, mature until well after they've left school, um, which probably explains quite a few things. Um, so it's probably around 25 to 30. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say that um, it's actually uh, later for males than it is for females, which might also explain some things. Um, sorry to all the beautiful men in my life. Uh, so, um, but for the kids with ADHD, they might be lagging behind a further three to five years. Um, so to expect them to be making all this decision-making around this at school is a bit rough. And there was a... a study a pilot that was done where they actually looked at increasing healthy choices alongside the sugary ones and increased the education and it actually made no difference on the sugar intake of the youth. Okay, so now um, thankfully our treasurer's not here, otherwise he might be going, well, how is the school ever going to raise funds if we can't sell soft drinks and chips? Okay, well, there's nothing to suggest you still can't have unhealthy options for fundraisers, um, although, you know, it would be good role modelling to include some healthy options for these as well. But I think the primary issue is about what's making up the diet of kids on most days and its impact in the school environment. So, of course, um, parents play a critical role in terms of what they provide in their in the kids' lunchboxes and at home, but school can also play a critical role. Um, so what are some, some suggested steps for a healthier school environment? So, of course, assessing the current state of the, the school meal and snack offerings. And as I mentioned earlier, our tuck shop has some really awesome, healthy and yummy options for lunches. And having just briefly looked at the menu, as I said, maybe it's just those smaller, cheaper snack items and drinks that might need to be looked at. 
It can also be like looking at what we put in vending machines, um, what's um, given out in classes for awards like lollies or class parties, um, and developing a plan and some policies to reduce those high sugar foods in the school environment. Obviously, you need to engage your stakeholders, your parents, teachers and students, and you might be surprised what ideas students come up with. I've seen some good examples of like case studies where youth councils, student councils have come up with some really great ideas. Um, you also need to include you know, your local community, including servos and shops. I know there's been concern about kids ducking out to buy lollies. I know of communities where they've had policies where the local shops won't serve kids during school hours uh, and things like that. Um, so, and of course, if you do, you know, decide to implement a plan, you know, it's a good idea to monitor it and do an evaluation to see if it's actually making a difference in affecting learning and behaviour. So, um, I know some people are probably thinking, well, that's, you know, it's impossible. We're just, we're fighting a losing battle. But, you know, limiting sugar in schools is something that has been done successfully in various places around the world. And where it's worked, the success factors seem to include, um, as I said, changing what's actually available. As we've discussed, expecting kids to be able to resist those sugary choices and make the better choices at school is just making it harder for kids who might struggle the most already. Um, and it also works um, best where there's a mix of um, those educational and environmental interventions. So still do the education as well. Um, and it has to be something that's long-term and sustainable. Um, school policies around what's available in tuck shops, vending machines and in classes is, is important. And there's lots of other ideas and case studies and success stories around um, don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I, as I said, I'm sure students, teachers and parents have lots of good suggestions as well. So I think we've heard enough tonight to know that reducing sugar in school has got the potential to have some really beneficial impacts on students' academic performance, their behaviour and their physical and mental health. Obviously, parents play a critical role in, consent, in uh, considering what they provide their kids to eat at home and at school. Um, and Melanda School has been a real leader in so many areas and has an opportunity to also be a leader in creating a healthy school environment. We have seen that there are challenges though, um, and, it, and it may not be easy, and our tuck shop conveners, parents and educators need to be valued, appreciated and supported uh, in providing good nutrition in schools in a cost-effective manner. And we also need the community to be on board, as I mentioned. So um, this is an exciting slide. <laughs> I have a bunch of references available for the more nerdy people of, of us here. Uh, and I'll try and make this presentation available as a handout and also the recording uh, for those who are interested. Um, and thank you to uh, our principal, uh, Mr Toshak, and the PNC for inviting me to uh, speak and uh, helping to organise it. And I'm also happy to answer any questions. Mm. Mm. Love, you talk a little bit about diet soft drinks. Yeah, please. yeah, great, great um, question. So um, the question was, uh, can you talk a bit about diet soft drinks? Yeah, yeah, no sugar soft drinks. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a couple of issues with no sugar soft drinks. Um, are they better than the sugar soft drinks? Probably yes, because you're still not getting the sugar, but it's it's still not great. So there's a there's two issues, well probably three issues with those diet soft drinks. So one is that um, there's still uh, they're still looking into whether there's evidence that some of those um, chemical sweeteners are you know carcinogenic and have other long term effects. Um, the other issue is that it's not retraining the brain to not want sweet things. So you might have the you know you're still making kids crave for sweet stuff. Um, and there's actually some evidence that if you uh, have, you know, like aspartame or some of these um, sweeteners, that it's not giving you the hit that you need, um, but it's still giving you that sort of craving for sweetness. So it may actually increase your intake later. So you may actually eat more sugary foods after you've had a diet soft drink. Um, so, so they're, you know, when we have diabetic patients, we'll say, yeah, look, if you really have to have a soft drink, yeah, have a Diet Coke or whatever. But honestly, the best thing would be if you could just have water or milk. So, And, and so does xylitol do? Does it work the same way? Yeah, so that's a good Yeah. So, yeah. 
really good question. So xylitol um, is my top pick if you have to have something sweet. So, if, you know, when you want to make sure the kids don't feel totally deprived. Um, so it still has sweetness. Um, it doesn't have those chemical things. It's natural. It's actually a prebiotic. So it's actually good for their gut microbiome um, and, you know, it's healthy. Um, but you, and it doesn't, for some reason, it doesn't still have that thing of wanting to eat more sugar afterwards. It has some sort of, um, you know, uh, satisfying effect without having the sugar hit. Uh, and maybe that's to do with that gut effect. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, though, I would still use that in moderation because you're still trying to just get your brain used to not wanting to have sweet stuff all the time. Yeah. And I always wondered, like we go, oh, it's a natural sweetener. Well, I'm sure there is a natural sweetener. Why do we not treat it as a natural sweetener? Yeah. It sort of gets stigmatised yeah. to be super bad, but we just have too much of it, like you said. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, yeah, so the, the question is, um, you know, sugar is a natural sweetener as well. So why are we stigmatising that? And um, is it, should we just have too much? And yeah, absolutely. And like I said, you know, we, you know, in the past, there were people who were quite healthy who would still have, you know, mum's cupcakes or, you know, the occasional, um, you know, desserts or whatever. Um, but as you say, we just have so much sugar in our diets now. It's crazy. Um, and in fact, I even got caught out. Um, I haven't told the boys yet this, but um, there's these things called harvest snaps that, you know, sort of they're allowed to occasionally have as a treat. And it's like it's a savoury chip thing made out of baked chickpeas in the health food section. And I looked at that the other day and for goodness sake, that's got sugar in it. Like, why do you need sugar in a savoury snack food? Yeah, sorry. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. That's it. So um, you're right. It's it's gone out of control, and and sugar in moderation is not a big problem. I guess the thing is why I might sound a really, really hard case now. I'm not saying you have to have absolutely no sugar. I'm not have you know the treats now and then, but it's just that um, we're probably getting way more sugar in our diet than we realise. And so then when we go, oh, we're just having this treat, it's already on top of a pile of sugar. You know, we've made nice healthy spaghetti bolognese in the past the sauce got a, has got a pile of sugar in it you know the tomato sauce is pretty much pure sugar um and then when it comes to the school environment like i said there's you know it's particularly trouble uh, problematic for kids when they're trying to learn and then if you've got kids with adhd or other things it's even more um you know problematic and and even just a little bit of sugar can really wreck their day so. laura is there anything that parents can do you know like if you there's no chance that I could ever cut sugar completely, you know, spread sugars and everything. My kids are you know, obviously head for that. What can parents do that can slow down the effects of that, you know, the crash and the, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, making it so that it's problematic yeah. for them learning-wise? Like, yeah. yeah. Is it about so, having so, other things in with yeah. the sugar? Yeah, good question. So the question was, um, can parents do anything to sort of uh, help ameliorate those lows and highs and, uh, you know, because it's not possible to cut everything out? So, yes, yeah, so there's a couple of things. So one is um, looking at what they call the GI of food. So sometimes you might see on packages, you know, low GI or whatever. So that's glycemic index that um, stands for, and that's a measure of how quickly a food turns into sugar in your body. And so by definition, the higher the GI, the, the more you're going to get a sugar rush and then the crash. So um, you look for low GI foods or foods that release um, the sugar slowly over time. And they're going to get a better you know, energy release and feel better through the day and focus more in class. Now, there's a couple of things that can increase, um, sorry, that decrease your GI. One is, um, so just general generalisations here. One is uh, fibre. So that's why a piece of fruit, even though it's got lots of sugar in it, um, is not going to give you the sugar rush that a fruit juice does because the juice is squeezing all the sugar out of the fruit, whereas the fruit's got, well, it's got less of it for a start, but it's got all that fibre and the fibre slows the absorption of sugar into your bloodstream. So things with more fibre in them. The other thing is that um, we know that a lot of acid stuff can slow GI. So, uh, for example, the boys, um, as some of you know, have a business with dried bananas and they uh, they dip them in lime juice and part of the theory behind that as well as they taste really good is that they um the lime juice slows down um, the sugar absorption so it lowers the gi so you know when you hear people talk about the glass of lemon juice before they eat for 
weight loss, whatever, you know, it's not it's not magic, but it does lower the GI of the food that you eat. And same with sushi. So sushi rice, um, sushi rice is a really high GI rice. It's pretty much like pure sugar. But when they make sushi, they toss it through vinegar. Um, so that lowers the GI and makes it healthier.